Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Today, Jill Robbins tells us about the approval of a huge financial assistance plan for Sri Lanka. Faith Perlo and Dan Novak present this week's education report. We close with the next part of our U.S. history series. But first, here is Jill Robbins. The International Monetary Fund, or IMF. Approved a nearly three billion dollar financial assistance plan for Sri Lanka Monday. The IMF also said it will carefully study Sri Lanka's governing practices, including possible corruption as part of the program. About three hundred thirty-three million dollars will be immediately provided to help solve the country's humanitarian crisis. The approval will also open up financial support from other international institutions. The South Asian country suspended repayment of its debt last year, when it lacked foreign currency needed to pay for imports of fuel and other important goods. The shortages led to street protests that forced out the country's president. The economic situation has improved under current president. Renil Wickremesinghe, but his plans to privatize state companies have brought opposition. Peter Brewer is the top IMF official in Sri Lanka. He said the IMF would study corruption and governance weaknesses in Sri Lanka, and provide suggestions. Since last year, Sri Lankans have protested in the street, demanding punishment and recovery. Of money allegedly stolen by members of a former ruling family, critics of the government say corruption has been the main factor behind the country's economic crisis. Kristalina Georgieva is IMF's managing director. She said in a statement that Sri Lanka's institutions and governance require deep reforms. The IMF's approval means Sri Lanka will no longer be considered a bankrupt nation. The country can also restart its normal dealings, Wickram Singha said in a statement on Tuesday. The approval will unlock financing of up to seven billion dollars from other international financial institutions. Wickram Singha said that as Sri Lanka's foreign currency improves. The country will slowly lift import restrictions. He said, "We will bring in essential goods, medicines, and goods needed for the tourism industry." He added that he expects to present the agreement with the IMF to Parliament Wednesday. Earlier this month, the last step for the approval was cleared when China joined Sri Lanka's other lenders. In providing promises for debt restructuring, China owns about ten percent of Sri Lanka's total foreign debt. The IMF required Sri Lanka to raise income taxes and remove government support for electricity and fuel. But Brewer said the impact of the reforms on the poor needs to be limited. Officials must now discuss with Sri Lanka's lenders. How to restructure its debt? Sri Lanka's foreign currency ran short as tourism and export earnings fell during the COVID-19 pandemic. Sri Lanka also faced heavy debt payments to Chinese and other lenders for large projects that did not create enough earnings. Sri Lanka also used its foreign currency holdings to try to strengthen Sri Lankan money. The rupee. Since Wickremesinghe became president, shortages have eased and hours-long daily power cuts have ended. 
the central bank says its currency holdings have improved and the black market no longer controls the foreign currency trade. However, workers' organizations oppose Wickramasinghe's plans to privatize state companies as part of his reform plan. And public anger may spread if he fails to act against the Rajapaksa family, who people believe were responsible for the economic crisis. Wickramasinghe's critics accuse him of protecting the Rajapaksa family in return for their support for his presidency. I'm Jill Robbins. More educators and researchers are bringing attention to misinformation spread through the Internet and social media. Teachers already face many difficulties. Adding what is called media literacy can be another problem. The concern is how some subjects are seen only as political issues. This could include issues like misinformation about vaccines, increasing world temperatures, and even Russia's war in Ukraine. The Associated Press says that those opposed to teaching Internet literacy say it is the same as thought control. This prevents some teachers from using it in their classes. Julie Smith is an expert on media literacy. She teaches at Webster University in the state of Missouri. She said teaching media literacy is not teaching what to think, but how to think. She said it's engaging about engaging your brain. It's asking who created this? Why? Why am I seeing it now? How does it make me feel and why? Erin McNeil is a mother from Massachusetts who has worked as a reporter. She said that media literacy is a skill that is just as important as computer engineering for the economy. She created a nonprofit group called Media Literacy Now. The organization supports digital literacy education. Basic communication is part of our information economy, and there will be huge implications for our economy if we don't get this right, McNeil said. Sean Lee teaches social studies in Seattle, Washington. He sees internet and media literacy as important for modern life as driver's education in high school. He has taught about double-checking online reports, getting information from more than a few places, and using critical thinking. He also created an organization for teachers to share resources. This technology is so new that no one taught us how to use it, Lee said. People are like, there's nothing we can do. I disagree with that. I would like to think the Republic can survive an algorithm. Teaching Internet literacy to fight misinformation may be more effective than new laws and changes to algorithms. Some U.S. states, like New Jersey, Illinois, and Texas, have added new standards for teaching Internet literacy. Subjects can include how the Internet and social media work, how to find misinformation by looking at many sources. Other ways of identifying misinformation might include looking for missing background information or recognizing emotional headlines. Media literacy is often included in social studies classes like history or government classes, offered at the high school level. But experts say it is never too early or late for people to become better Internet users. Media and Internet literacy is taught around the world. In Finland, children learn about the Internet in preschool when they are about four or five years old. 
the program is part of an anti-misinformation program for the population to be more aware and resistant to false internet claims. Finland and Canada have developed programs over the years to teach young people about the media. The goal is to get young people to understand what in the news and on the internet is a fact and what is not. Finland has fought misinformation spread by its neighbor, Russia. Finland expanded its programs after the 2014 Russian invasion of Crimea. Learning about misinformation does not stop in school. Finland has public service announcements and programs for older adults who are more at risk of misinformation than younger people who seem more at home on the Internet. Petri Honkonen is Finland's Minister of Science and Culture. He spoke to the Associated Press during a recent trip to Washington, D.C. His trip included discussions of Finland's actions to fight Internet misinformation. Media literacy was one of our priorities before the time of the Internet. The point is critical thinking, and that is a skill that everybody needs more and more. We have to somehow protect people. We also must protect democracy, he said. Media literacy programs in Canada began many years ago, but have been expanded to the digital age. Matthew Johnson is the Director of Education at Media Smarts, a nonprofit organization that runs media literacy programs. Johnson said media literacy is accepted as an important part of preparing students in Canada. Media and internet literacy is often compared to driver's education. We need speed limits. We need well-designed roads and good regulations to ensure cars are safe. But we also teach people how to drive safely, Johnson said. Johnson added that people need to have the tools to think critically about what they see and read. The Internet and social media can be seen like the wave of new automobiles about 100 years ago. It took almost 30 years before the first driver's education classes were offered. The government passed laws for vehicle safety and driver behavior. The auto industry added safety devices like seat belts and airbags. This combination of government, industry, and educators is considered the model that is needed for internet and media literacy. Education is needed for an effective answer to fight internet misinformation. I'm Faith Perlow. And I'm Dan Novak. You just heard Faith Perlow and Dan Novak present this week's education report. Faith is here now to talk more about the story. Welcome back, Faith. It's great to be here, Ashley. This week, you wrote about media and internet literacy and the need for it in our school system. Yes, this is an important issue. And not just for school-aged children. College students and adults who maybe grew up with the internet and social media might have a hard time understanding what is factual and what is misinformation or disinformation. Can you tell us the difference between these two? Both obviously have the word information in them. Correct. Both words are about how information is spread. Misinformation is false information presented as fact. It is not spread or shared with a negative intent, meaning that maybe the facts got mixed up, someone misquoted someone. It's unintentional. So is disinformation different because it is false information spread on purpose? Yes, it is also false information, hence the other negative prefix of dis. But it is purposefully misleading and shared. 
so the people or groups sharing that information know that it is false, and they're sharing it anyways. That's why it's so important to have classes or lessons on internet and media literacy, so we can understand the difference and spot mis- or disinformation. We actually have news literacy lessons on the VOA Learning English website. People can find it under the Advanced category for learners. I know. I used to use them with my media and culture class back in the day. Well, thank you again, Faith, for joining me today. Thanks for having me once again, Ashley. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. The years after World War I were an important turning point in the making of the American nation. The country turned away from the problems of Europe. Now it would deal with problems of its own. Kay Gallant and Morris Joyce tell about the many changes in America during the early 1920s. There was a presidential election in America in 1920. President Woodrow Wilson was not a candidate. He had suffered a stroke and was too sick. The two major candidates were Democrat James Cox and Republican Warren Harding. Voters had a clear choice between the two candidates. Cox supported the ideas of President Wilson. He believed the United States should take an active part in world affairs. Harding opposed the idea of internationalism. He believed the United States should worry only about events within its own borders. Warren Harding won the election. By their votes, Americans made clear they were tired of sacrificing lives and money to solve other people's problems. They just wanted to live their own lives and make their own country a better place. This was a great change in the nation's thinking. For twenty years since the beginning of the century, the United States had become more involved in international events. Young Americans had grown up with presidents like Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt. Both Wilson and Roosevelt had active foreign policies. Both helped start the nation on the road to becoming a major world power. Then came World War I. It was like a sharp needle that burst the balloon. The United States and the Allies won the war against Germany and the Central Powers. But thousands of American troops had died in the European conflict, and many months were taken up by the bitter debate over the peace treaty and the League of Nations. Most Americans did not want to hear about Europe and international peace organizations anymore. Instead, Americans became more concerned with material things. During World War I, they had lived under many kinds of restrictions. The federal government had controlled railroads, shipping, and industrial production. At the end of the war, these controls were lifted. Industries that had been making war supplies began making products for a peacetime economy. Wages for most workers in the United States were higher than ever at the beginning of the 1920s. Men and women had enough money to enjoy life more than they had 
in the past. Technology made it possible for millions of people to improve their lives. It also caused great changes in American society. Two of the most important new technologies were automobiles and radio. In the early years of the 20th century, automobiles were very costly. Each one was built separately by a small team of skilled workers. Most Americans did not have the money to own an automobile. Then Henry Ford decided to make cars everyone could buy. He built them on an assembly line. Cars were put together or assembled as they moved slowly through the factory. Each worker did just one thing to the car before it moved on to the next worker. In this way, the Ford Motor Company could build cars more quickly and easily, and it could sell them for much less money. Before long, there were cars everywhere. All these cars created a need for better roads. Outside cities, most roads were made just of dirt. They were chokingly dusty in dry weather and impassably muddy in the rain. They were rough and full of holes. Few bridges connected roads across rivers and streams. America's new drivers demanded that these problems be fixed. So local and state governments began building and improving roads as they had never done before. As new roads were built, many new businesses opened along them. There were gasoline stations and auto repair shops, of course, but soon there were eating places and hotels where travelers could eat and sleep. In the 1920s, the United States was becoming a nation of car lovers. Cars changed more than the way Americans traveled. They changed the way Americans lived. They removed some of the limitations of living conditions. For example, families with cars no longer had to live in noisy, crowded cities. They could live in suburbs, the wide open areas outside cities. They could use their car to drive to work in the city. Businesses moved too. No longer did they have to be close to railroad lines. With new cars and trucks, they could transport their goods where they wanted, when they wanted. They were no longer limited by train times. Cars also made life on farms less lonely. It became much easier for farm families to go to town on business or to visit friends. Cars helped Americans learn more about their nation. In the 1920s, people could drive all across the land for not much money. Places that used to be days apart now seemed suddenly closer. Families that normally stayed home on weekends and holidays began to explore the country. They drove to the seashores and lake shores, to the mountains and forests, to places of historical importance or natural beauty. Not all the changes linked to the car were good, of course. 
automobile accidents became more common and deadly. Other forms of transportation, such as railroads, began to suffer from the competition. Some railroads had to close down. Horses and wagons, once the most common form of transportation, began to disappear from city streets. There were not enough cars in the 1920s to cause severe air pollution, but the air was becoming less pure every year, and the roads were becoming more crowded and noisy. While the automobile greatly changed America's transportation, radio greatly changed its communication. The first radio station opened in the state of Pennsylvania in 1920. Within 10 years, there were hundreds of others. There were more than 13 million radio receivers. Most of the radio stations were owned by large broadcasting networks. These networks were able to broadcast the same program to stations all over the country. Most programs were simple and entertaining. There were radio plays, comedy shows, and music programs. But there also were news reports and political events. Millions of people who never read newspapers now heard the news on radio. Citizens everywhere could hear the president's voice. Like the automobile, radio helped bring Americans together. They were able to share many of the same events and experiences. Radio also was a great help to companies. Businesses could buy time on radio programs for advertisements. In these ads, they told listeners about their products. They urged them to buy the products, cars, electric refrigerators, foods, medicines. In this way, companies quickly and easily created a nationwide demand for their goods. Automobiles and radios were not the only new technologies to change American life in the days after World War I. Still, one more invention would have a great effect on how Americans spent their time and money. That was the motion picture. And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan.